Live as children of light. And find out what pleases the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and, and in his, his mighty, mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against, against the, the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers. Against the authorities. Against the powers of this dark world. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. darkness but rather expose them. Expose them. Expose them. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand, stand your ground. ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. With your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith. With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Stand firm and live as children of the light. Stand firm and live as children of light. Stand firm and live as children of the light. Stand firm. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here at Grace. And of course, like Tommy said, if you're joining us on live stream, it's great to have you uh, with us as well. And uh, if you are a guest with us today, or if it's your first time back in a while, we're so glad that you are able to be with us here. And you're actually catching us in the second week of a five-part series uh, that we are calling Dangerous Living. And uh, so if you are just kind of tuning in, like I said, it's the second week, you might be asking the question, what is this series about? Like, what is it that we're kind of talking about uh, through this sermon series together? And so last week, we, when we started the conversation, we actually began with a pretty simple premise. We said, here's kind of the starting place uh, where we want to begin this conversation. And we want to start by assuming a couple things, right? We want to say, first off, it seems like something has gone wrong in the world. And then secondly, it seems like there's something that's gone wrong in us. And so we said, we want to we just kind of want to start there. And here's, here's what I believe. I think maybe every single one of us in the room, probably for the most part, I could probably safely say that, would to some, to some extent or another agree with those two things. Uh, this is actually uh, something that has been observed throughout all of human history and through all cultures is what is sometimes called the problem of evil, right? That when we look into the world that we live in, uh, what do we see? Well, we see that as beautiful as this world is, and, and it is, it's magnificent, that it seems as if there's something that's gone amiss, right? When we look in the world, we see such immense beauty, we, such, we see the creation and, and, and just something that's so magnificent and mysterious to us, and yet at the same time, we see tragedy and we see sickness and we see suffering and we see pandemic, and it appears like something has gone, something's gone terribly wrong in the world. And not only in the world, but we would even say in us, in humanity, that we look at humanity as beautiful as humanity is and as amazing as the human race is, which it is. It is amazing if you stop and think about uh, who we are as human beings, that as beautiful as we are, that there also seems like there's something that's gone wrong. Uh, when we look throughout history, and even when we look around the world today, what do we see? Uh, we see division. We see wars. We see uh, hurtful and harmful things that we do to each other. We see uh, sometimes sick and demented things that we see to each other. And I would even say maybe if we took it a step further, not only is there something wrong in the world and something wrong in us, but I think if we were really honest, some of us would look and say, and that means me too, that there's something that seems like it's amiss even in me, that there's the good that I want to do, and yet sometimes it seems like I can't stop doing it. There's patterns of behavior there's issues that are in my life that I know it's just not, it's not the right thing, it's not the good thing, and yet it seems like I keep returning back to those things, or sometimes I can't stop myself from doing some of those things. And I think we'd look and say, this is kind of the premise. And so the question then we're pursuing then is, okay, well, if that's true, if something is wrong in the world, and maybe there's something that's amiss in us, what happened, right? What is it that is the matter? And then how do we make sense of it, and what do we do about it? Like, what do we actually do about that? And that's actually uh, kind of the heartbeat, the beginning point of uh, this conversation that we're in. In fact, we actually said that throughout this entire series, we actually want to look together really just at one key passage. And so we said there is one passage that we're basing this whole series out of, and it is right here, is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. And so I would even invite you and encourage you, if you've got your Bible, why don't you go ahead and open it up right now. And if you would turn, to me, uh, turn with me 
to Ephesians 6. If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, we have some under the chairs. Page 817 is where you're going to find Ephesians chapter 6, and so I'd encourage you to do that. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, we would love for you to take one of those. So if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible, uh, take one of those home with you. We'd love for you to have that. So Ephesians 6 is, is where we're, it's kind of home base for this whole series. Now, the reason that we're looking at this passage and we're really just spending time unpacking eight verses is because this passage, I believe, is really, in a lot of ways, the central teaching in the entire New Testament of the Bible of a topic that is sometimes called spiritual warfare, okay? And so what we're gonna see in Ephesians chapter six is really, it's one of the most condensed, most consolidated places where it's going to teach about what the rest of scripture teaches and that's this idea, like I said, kind of a spiritual warfare. It's going to help give language and it's going to help give some answers to the tension that we feel in the world and the tension that we even feel within ourselves. So that's what we're kind of digging at and we're looking at together. Last week, we started by looking at just three verses and we looked at the first three in this passage. And here's, here's what it says. So just to kind of recap, it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil that are in the heavenly realms. Okay, so we said three very quick verses, but these are just packed. There's so much that is contained within these verses. And we said that these verses, again, they help us give some language and they help us give some answers to the struggle that we face, to some of the tension that we feel in this world. In fact, last week, if you were here, we spent the entire week just going through what does the Bible teach about this battle, about this struggle that we face. And if you were here, you might remember we said there's three things that we see in this passage and we see in the Bible. First thing we said is we said that the battle is spiritual. It's spiritual. There is a large spiritual component to what we see in the world and to what we see in humanity. In fact, so much so that the Apostle Paul in this passage says, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against these spiritual forces. So the Bible's gonna say, listen, that what's wrong in the world and what's wrong in us and the tension that we feel, that that is more than just physical, sorry, physical, that's more than just empirical, but that is actually something that is spiritual. In fact, the Bible's going to say that the spiritual component contributes more to the struggles that we face than even the physical aspect of it. So we talked about that. The second thing we said, we said this battle is methodical. It's methodical. And what we meant by that is we said this battle is not random. Uh, this is a structured, it is an organized, it is a, it is a, uh, it is a methodical, there's a method behind it, battle. And so we talked about that. We, we looked at what the Bible says, that there is a real enemy uh, that there is a real Satan, which might seem strange to some of you, but the Bible is very clear on this, and that there are real strategies behind this war that we're in. And the last thing we talked about is we said it's personal. Battle's personal. And this is not just some vague, ambiguous war that's taking place out there somewhere. We said it's deeply personal. In fact, what we're gonna see throughout this series is that the primary location of the battle that we face is actually right between our ears, that it's in the things that we believe. It's in the worldview that we, in which we see the world, in which we interpret reality. That is the largest place in which we see the spiritual battle take place. Now, again, if you're new or if you're just kind of tuning in at Grace for the first time, this might sound so weird to you and it might sound so bizarre. Maybe you've never heard a talk on any of these things. And I would just encourage you, if you missed last week, I would, I would really encourage you to go back and catch up and listen to that. I think it laid some very important groundwork. And also we dealt with even some objections that some people might have. And so I would encourage you to do that. This week what we're gonna do though, as we continue in this series, I wanna think about this. Okay, so if this is true about the battle, if it's a spiritual battle, a methodical battle, if it's a personal battle, what do we do about that, right? I mean, how do you, how do you fight a battle like this? And so I wanna uh, spend some time this week and the next few weeks that we're together really digging into to that question. Now today, what I wanna do with the entire time that we have is I actually just wanna double down on one statement that is said in this passage, just one statement that I think is crucial to understanding, to kind of to to understand this, this battle that we're facing. And that's this right here. So in verse 10 and 11, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against, and here it is, against the devil's schemes. 
right, the devil's scheme. So I actually want to spend pretty much the entire time that we have here today really talking about what that means when the Bible talks about this idea of the devil's schemes. It's actually a really interesting term that's used here. If you were with us last week, we alluded to this, but the word schemes that's used in the original language, the Greek language with the New Testament is written, you could tell even just by looking at the word what English word we get from it, right? So we get the word methods from this word, strategies or methods. What the Bible is telling us is that we have an enemy, a real enemy, and that he has methods, he has schemes. In fact, the, the definition of the word literally is following an orderly and technical procedure in the handling of something. And so here's, here's what I want you to get. And the Bible is going to teach this all over the place, all over the place, that there is a real enemy and that he has strategies, that he has a method, that he has a scheme, that there is a way that he works and here's the interesting thing, is the Bible is going to tell us that we shouldn't be ignorant of the way that he works. And so let me show you one passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul says, we are not ignorant of the devil's schemes, that we know how he works. Now here's why I think it's so important that we spend today thinking about this, is because what I have found is that quite honestly, many people who follow Jesus are ignorant of the devil's schemes. And that's not because we're ignorant people. That's not what I'm saying. I think it's just because maybe we've never studied it or maybe we've never heard a teaching on it before. And so I just thought, you know what? Before we move forward, we need to just talk about what does the Bible teach about the enemy's schemes? How does our enemy work? Now, before we jump into that, let me just say this because some of you might be thinking, man, why would we spend a whole week talking about this in church? Like, this just seems like it's unrelated to my life. And it just seems like, like, why would we, it seems like, why would we inordinately focus on something like this? And, and let me just tell you why I think it's so important that we spend some time thinking about this. Okay, so here, here's a good way to think about it. Uh, December 12th, there is a very important showdown that is happening. Does anyone know what's happening on December 12th? Yes, what is it? Shout it out to me. Yes, so Ohio State is going to be playing Michigan. It is the classic battle of good and evil, right? So that's coming up here on December 12th. Now, I think as we think about this game that's coming up um, and this historic good battle of good and evil, I think you could argue that the most important thing, the most important thing that the good guys could do in preparation for this game is they should know their own playbook. Like that is one of the most important things they can do is that all of the players are on the same page, that they all understand their own playbook, it's memorized, they know their offensive and defensive strategies, and that they're on the same page, they're unified in those things. That would be the most important thing for them. But I think you could also argue that the second most important playbook that they need to know, the second most important offensive and defensive strategies they need to know are that of the evil one, right? They need to know the schemes. They need to know, get this, the methods. They need to know the, the tactics of the enemy. That's why coaches will spend all this time reviewing tapes. They'll study the different strategies of their opponent. Why? Because it makes them prepared and it helps them stand up against the enemy's schemes. All right. Now, the Bible is going to tell us the same thing. The most important thing followers of Jesus need to know, right? If you're a Christian in this room, or if you're a Christian who's watching right now, the most important thing we need to know is our own playbook, for sure. We need to know the truth of what God's word teaches. But I think you could also say that probably the second most important thing we need to know is how the enemy works, is how the enemy works. What are his tactics and what are his schemes? So what are they then? What are his schemes? Well, let me tell you what I believe, okay? I believe that in the Bible, when you look at the mention of our enemy, it's gonna talk about him in several places. Uh, we talked about this last week. What you're gonna notice is he is actually never in one time given a formal name. He's never given a name. So we'll, we'll call him Satan, we'll call him the devil. But we talked about this last week. Those are actually not names. They're not names, they're titles. And so throughout the Bible, he is given several titles. And I believe that those titles, what they do is they reveal to us his schemes. And so if you know his titles, you know how he works. And so um, let's give you, give you an example of what I'm talking about. When you look in the Bible, you're gonna see that he's given seven different several different titles, and they're often used interchangeably. So here's a great example. Revelation chapter 12 is talking about our enemy, and notice what it says about him. 
It says, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Now, I don't know if you noticed, five times in this passage, he has given different titles. He's called the dragon, he's called the serpent, he's called the devil, he's called Satan, he's called the deceiver. And that's just a sampling. If you look through the rest of the Bible, he's gonna be called the accuser, he's gonna be called the adversary, he's gonna be called the evil one. It's called a lot of different things. But here's my theory. Okay, my theory is that these titles reveal something about how he works. So because of that, what I wanna do is I actually just wanna talk about three. I think you can boil everything the Bible says about him. I think you can boil it down to really three things, at least for the sake of our conversation. And what are the three things that we need to know? We don't wanna be ignorant of the devil's schemes. We don't wanna be obsessed with them either, but we don't wanna be ignorant, so what are they? Well, I, I just wanna say that maybe this is a good way to think of it. Here, here's three things that we're gonna see, okay? The Bible's gonna tell us that he's the opposer. He's the opposer. He's the accuser. He's the accuser, and then he's the deceiver. He's the deceiver. So the Bible's gonna say we shouldn't be ignorant of the devil's schemes. He has schemes. What are they? Well, I just wanna tell you, I think that you can boil it down to these three things. He's the opposer, he's the accuser, and he's the deceiver. So let's think about those things together. All right, we'll start with this. He's the opposer. And you're gonna see this, you're gonna see this personified in a lot of different names he's given. He's called the enemy. He's called the adversary. Probably the most popular name that he, title he's given in the New Testament is Satan. He's Satan. Now, here's what's interesting, and I don't know if you knew this or not. I actually just learned this this past week, and this kind of blew my mind a little bit. I was studying a, a scholar by the name of Michael Heiser, and he pointed this out. I thought it was really interesting. In the New Testament, the word that's used for Satan is used 34 times, and it's this Greek word right here. Okay, now, I don't even really know how to pronounce it, but that's the Greek word for Satan, and here's what I think is interesting. Where that comes from is it actually comes, it's transliterated from an Old Testament word in the Hebrew. So the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And it's this word, which is Satan. That's where we get Satan from. And here's what I thought was interesting. The word Satan in the Old Testament is used in a very generic sense to talk about anyone who opposes or who is adverse to or is an adversary to someone else. That's what it talks about. And so I thought this was so interesting. Uh, the Bible in the Old Testament is gonna use the word Satan for anyone, not just the devil, devil, but for anyone who opposes another person. So I'll give you a couple examples. Now, let me just tell you, this first one might sound really weird to you, but just stick with me for a second. Did you know in the Old Testament, there is a place when the angel of the Lord is called a Satan? Did you know that? It's, let me show you what I'm talking about. So just, just, so just stick with me for a second. In Numbers 22, it says, the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose, and in the, in the Hebrew, the word is Satan. He was a Satan to Balaam. Okay, so you can read about that story in the Old Testament. There's this guy named Balaam. He's trying to go somewhere, and the angel of the Lord gets in his way. He blocks him. And the word that's used for that activity the, use that, the, the word that's used for someone who's taking that position is the word Satan. Now, I'm not saying that the angel of the Lord is Satan. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that this is a very generic term that's used for anyone who opposes something. And I'll show you another place, just one more. In the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel 19, uh, David is gonna talk to two of his soldiers, two of his warriors, and he's gonna say to them, what right do you have to interfere? And the word interfere there is the same word. It's that word Satan. It's the word to be an opposer. By the way, I think this, this, this helps us make sense, I think, of some of you might remember if you're familiar with your Bible in um, Matthew 16. There's a spot where uh, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan, get behind me. Now, does that mean that Peter was like possessed by the devil at that point in time? I don't think so. I think what it meant was that he was opposing something that Jesus wanted to accomplish. And so he was being a Satan. That's what he was doing. Now, all that might sound like real heady and theological to some of you. So let me see if I can just put it as simply as I know how to put it. When I think about the idea of someone being a Satan, someone playing the role of a Satan, the first thing that came to my mind when I was studying this was my two-year-old uh, boy, Louie. Okay, so, so when I think of the Satan, I sometimes think of Louie. And that sounds heartless, but let me explain it, okay? So, so Louie, this is my little boy, he's two. He's our youngest of four. He's super cute, super cute. And he looks super innocent in this picture. But don't let that deceive you because he, he can sometimes be uh, the role he can play, he can play the Satan. And so here's what I mean by that. So like I said, we got four kids. Louie's the youngest. 
The older kids all like to play Legos. They like to build Lego towers. They like to build Lego cars. They like to have Lego building competitions. And so we've actually had to teach our older kids that if you want to play with your Legos, you have to go into your room and you have to lock the door. And why is that? Because there is a Satan, right? There is an opposer who, who wants to destroy everything that you're doing. So when, he, when, my, when the older kids are playing with Legos, he doesn't even want to come in and play Legos with them. He's got his own game in mind. And his game is destroy everyone else's stuff. And so they'll build a tower, he'll come over and he'll kick it over, you know? They'll have like Legos designated at the side for a project, like hand-selected Legos. He'll come over and just snatch them away from them and do whatever it takes. And I'm telling you, there's been so many tears that have been shed because of the Satan who's coming around to destroy everything, all right? It's used in that way. Now, so what does that tell us when the Bible calls, calls the, our enemy the opposer or Satan? What is that telling us about him? Here, here's what it's telling us. His ultimate goal, all right, you gotta understand your enemy. Don't be ignorant of his schemes. His ultimate goal is to destroy whatever God is trying to do in your life. That's his goal. Whatever work he's trying to do in you, whatever work he's trying to accomplish through you, that's what he's trying to oppose. Listen, everything that God is trying to build in you, character, patience, love, faith, he wants to build those things in you, right? Ministry, he wants to build in you a capacity to be used by him. Satan wants to kick that over. Everything good that he wants to accomplish in your marriage and in your family and with your children and in our life groups, and in our church. He, he just wants to take it away. That's what he wants to do. That is his ultimate goal. He, he, he is antagonistic to everything that God wants to accomplish in and through us. And I want you just to consider with, with me for a minute some of the things that Jesus says about our enemy. Look, look at some of the words he uses about his activity. He says in Matthew 13, 19, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom, that, by the way, is the gospel, it's the message of the gospel, when anyone hears about that and they don't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away, snatches away what was sown into their heart. The word snatch away literally means to take by force. You see, what's he doing? He, he's just opposing. He's trying to tear down the things that God is trying to build up. How about this one? In Luke 22, Jesus says to Simon, 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 behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith might not fail. And so he says, he says, man, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. And some of you are like, I don't even know what that means. Well, it's actually an interesting word picture that he gives. So back in the first century, uh, it was actually a pretty common activity that after harvest, you would sift your wheat. It was a very violent process. You put all of the wheat into the sifting bowl. It basically was a big bowl with kind of like a metal screen on the bottom of it. And you would violently shake the thing. And it would separate the wheat from the chaff. And so the wheat would fall to the ground and the chaff would blow away. And, and here he says, here's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to shake you. He wants to shake you. And why? What is he trying to shake? Your faith. He's trying to shake your faith. That's what he's saying. So one of the activities of the enemy is he wants to introduce situations and he wants to introduce violent circumstances that are going to violently shake your faith. You know, things like breakups and difficulty and loss and pandemics and, I mean, you name it, stuff to just shake you down to the core. That's what he wants to do, he wants to do. How about this one? Uh, First Thessalonians, the apostle Paul says, we wanted to come to you, and I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. See, here he's gonna say, again, blocked. He's the opposer. He's trying to stop whatever it is that God is trying to accomplish. He wants to block ministry. He wants to block the opportunity for people to hear about Jesus. That's what he wants to do. Uh, he, look at this, uh, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I've come that people might have life and have it to the full. So Jesus has come that we might have life and have it to the fullest. The enemy wants the opposite. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything that God is trying to accomplish. I think here's what's going on. I think the enemy understands that every healthy, growing Christian poses a big threat to, to his kingdom, to the enemy's kingdom. And so he wants to thwart that and he wants to stop that at all costs. 
And let me just say, if you're someone who's a new Christian in the room, maybe you just recently started following Jesus, I think it's really important you understand this. I, I don't want you to be ignorant of his schemes because the moment that you start trying to really live for God, and I think all of us know this, the moment you really start trying to live for real for Jesus, there's gonna be opposition. It's just gonna show up. And I just don't want you to be surprised by that. It's, it's, it's not like it's a weird thing when that happens. There is an opposer. And, and that doesn't mean that we should um, lament when that happens. It doesn't mean we should give up when that happens. But it just means that you should know that that's going to happen. You're going to be opposed. Sometimes living for God is gonna feel like you're trying to build a Lego tower with a destructive two-year-old on the loose. And everything that you're trying to build, it's going to, at certain times, be threatened to be knocked over. There's going to be opposition. And some of you, even right now, you know, you walked in here today, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you are feeling opposition right now. You are. Some of you are trying to make steps to follow Jesus. You're trying to do things in your life that you know God desires and he wants, and it just feels like every time you take one step back, one step forward, it's like two steps back. And there's this pushback. And, there's, and some of you right now, some of you are involved in ministry. You know, maybe you're leading Bible studies or maybe you're leading a life group or maybe you just personally are investing in another person and you're trying to help other people know and grow in Jesus or whatever. Maybe you're investing in your own kids that way. And I'm telling you, you probably feel this. You feel opposition. Man, we're feeling that as a church. This whole last season, we're trying to make steps forward spiritually and it's like, it's just another thing that's trying to hold it back, hold it back. And I'm just saying, we shouldn't be surprised by this. There is an enemy. Some of you right now are feeling the opposition. There are situations that are happening in your life right now that are shaking your faith. Shake, and I mean, you could point to a million things that are happening in our culture right now that are faith-shaking circumstances. And hey, we just can't be surprised. We don't want to be ignorant of the devil's schemes. We know that he is an opposer. Not just an opposer, the Bible's going to say he's also an accuser, so we don't want to be ignorant of how he works so how does he oppose the things of God? Well, one of the ways that he does it is he does it by accusing. He does it by accusing. This is revealed in his name, the devil. So he is sometimes called the devil. He is sometimes called the slanderer. He is sometimes called the accuser. Now, again, devil is not a name. It's, a, it's, it's just a title. It's a, it is a, a title that's given. It's Diablos. And all Diablos means is it means, it means to accuse or it means to slander another person. In fact, the word Diablos is actually used in the New Testament of Christians who slander other people. It's, 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 if you slander or gossip someone, you're called a Diablos. That's what that is. So he's called the slanderer, the accuser. So the question then is, okay, well, if he's the accuser, who exactly does he accuse? And the short answer is, um, well, everyone. He accuses everybody. So he accuses God, he accuses you, and he accuses others. So first off, he accuses God. I think one of the, um, one of the greatest case studies of how he works is actually found in some of the earliest chapters of the Bible. Genesis chapter three, I think, really reveals to us a lot of his MO. Uh, some of you are familiar with it, but in Genesis three, we actually see the first temptation of the first humans and we see the first rebellion, the first sin that takes place in Genesis chapter three. And the Bible tells us this, as Genesis one and two, God creates everything, he creates humanity, and then he looks at humanity and he basically gives them unlimited freedom. God looks at people and he says, listen, you can do anything you want, you can eat from any tree, and he only gives them one restriction. That's it, just one prohibition. It is a million yeses, and it's one no, that's it. And then the enemy comes in in Genesis chapter three, and I want you to notice his carefully selected word choice. Look what he does. He comes up to the woman in Genesis 3, one, and he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, I think you can see what's going on here. That's not what God said. God said a million yeses and one no. You can do anything you want, there's just one thing. You can eat from any tree but one. And so the enemy comes in and he grossly exaggerates what God said. And then in verse five, look at what he does. He said, God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes are gonna be opened and you're gonna be like him. You're gonna know good and evil. What's happening here? I think it's pretty clear. The underlying assumption is clear. He is opposing God. He is accusing him. He is accusing him. What he's saying is this. God is excessively restricting 
That's what he is. He's, God is trying to hold you back is what he's doing. And if you really want to be free, and if you really want to live up to your potential, what you need to do is you need to run away from God. That's what you need to do. And this is an accusation against God. And he's been doing this from the very, very beginning. And I'm going to tell you, he continues to do it today. Maybe, maybe for some of you, you can relate to this. You have heard in your own thoughts accusations against God. So stuff like this. Maybe it showed up like this. You, know, think, you think a thought like this. God is holding you back. Obedience to God means the death of fun and happiness. And so some of us think that. We, this is an accusation that goes in our mind. If I live for God, I'm going to be missing out. If I follow God, it's going to limit me as a human being. That if, I, if we want to advance as a society and if I want to advance as a human, then we need to not run to God, we need to run away from God. That if you want to find joy and freedom in this life, run from the author of life. That is the great deception since the very, very beginning. Sometimes it shows up like this. God doesn't actually care about you. He didn't care about you. If he did care about you, how could he have let fill in your blank happen? How could he, if, if God really cared about you, how could he have let the divorce happen, the breakup happen? How could he, how could he have let the diagnosis happen? How could he have let the disease, the loss happen? How could he have let COVID happen if he really cared about us and he really loved us? These are thoughts of accusation against God. How about this one? God can't take care of you. He can't take you. You've got to take, you are on your own. And he, he is not going to adequately care for you. And so you will do a better job than he can. God doesn't even exist. This is all a dumb waste of time. Now, now, let me just ask you, even as I put these on the screen, I'm just trying to name the accusations that sometimes come into our minds against God without, without showing your hands. How many of you would say that, yeah, you have experienced those kind of thoughts before? And I would just tell you, I have, I do. And I'm just saying, don't be surprised by it. There is an accuser and he accuses our father and he accuses God. Don't be surprised about it. We don't want to be ignorant of the enemy's schemes. He's going to accuse God. Not only is he going to accuse God, you know who else he's going to accuse? You. He's going to accuse you. This has been one of his greatest strategies from the very beginning. He, he wants to deceive us into disobeying the will of our Father, and then quickly on the heels of that, he wants to accuse us of, of, uh, of, of wrongdoing. Um, you guys remember, I was thinking about this this past week. You guys remember the movie The Lion King? Remember that movie? I was thinking about Scar, Remember Scar, this dude, and um, he's like he's like the perfect villain. Is he? He's like such a such a fantastic uh, portrays a villain so fantastically. You remember how he works though in the movie? Remember how he works? What he does is he cunningly deceives Simba into disobeying the will of his father Mufasa. So Mufasa's the king, you know, and he's like looks at his son Simba and he's like the whole kingdom is yours, son. Just don't go into the elephant graveyard. And then, Muf and then uh, Scar comes along. He deceives Simba to do the one thing his father said not to do. He gets in danger. Mufasa has to give his life for his son. And then after Mufasa dies, what does Scar do? You remember this? Remember what Scar does? He comes up to Simba and he accuses him. He says, this is your fault. You need to never show your face around here ever again. And so Simba believes the lie and he goes and runs away and he lives in a state of suppressed denial rather than living out his royal identity. Now, let me ask you, does that story sound familiar to anyone else? I don't know. It's like the gospel according to the Lion King. And I'm just telling you, we know who that is. We know who that is. That's how the enemy works. He is an accuser. You know what the Bible says? He is like a prosecuting attorney who just accuses, accuses those who follow Jesus over and over again accuses them. This is what Revelation says in Revelation 12. It says, the accuser of our brothers and sisters. He accuses them before God day and night. And so he accuses true Christians. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that means you too. Now, how often does he accuse us, by the way? You notice how often he does it? Day and night. Round the clock. Takes no break. You wake up in the middle of the night, he's ready to accuse you. Wake up in the morning, he's ready to accuse you. All day long, he's ready to accuse you, and he's, he's prepared to do it. He is the accuser. And it shows up in all kinds of thoughts, maybe stuff like this. Maybe, maybe you can relate to some of these. You know what? Because of your past and your damaged goods, 
how inadequate you are to serve God. You know, the stuff that you did, the decisions that you made, God, listen, God could never use you, all right? So you're always gonna be a second-class citizen in God's case. So don't even try, don't even try. Stuff like this. God is so disappointed in you. And you know, if you could just, if you could just get your act together, you could, you could be so much more for him. So it's like that. How about this? You have nothing good to offer anyone. Or no one likes you and they're just putting up with you. And so because of that, the best thing you can do is never let anyone close to you ever. Don't connect, get connected to a life group. Stay surfacy as much as possible. How about this one? Because of blank, you're not, or you're not blank enough, whatever it might be. You could fill it in. You're not smart enough, good enough, gifted enough. You're not whatever enough. God could never use you to share your faith with another person. You don't know enough about your Bible. God could never use you to invest in another person spiritually because you just, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. If they knew how messed up you really are, you could never really do that. And it shows up in things like that. Uh, you, you know what? You should just quit serving Jesus. You're not getting anywhere anyway. How can you expect God to empower you when you haven't even talked to him for the past several days? And then even stuff like this, you're a fraud. You're a fraud. You may have other people convinced, but you're really an imposter. If people really knew the kind of stuff you thought, they really knew the kind of person you were, I mean, you might have everyone else tricked into thinking you're one thing, but you're really an imposter. Now, let me just ask you, for anyone who's here, and you don't need to show your hand or whatever, but how many of you would say, yeah, I've, I've thought stuff like that. I've heard thoughts like accusations like that. Let me just tell you, I do. I do. Only every time I try to serve Jesus Christ, every time I get up on a platform to try to present his word, accusations show up. They just show up. And all I'm saying is, let's not be ignorant of the devil's schemes. It's gonna happen. Let's expect it. We know it's gonna happen because he's the accuser of the brethren. He's going to accuse you. He's going to accuse God. And then, by the way, he's also going to accuse others. He's going to accuse others. Like we said just a minute ago, he's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. And you know, I think it's amazing how remarkably susceptible all of us are to have suspicious thoughts about another person and accusatory thoughts about another person. And we never stop to consider that maybe those thoughts are not from God or maybe those thoughts are not from us. You know, I think it's really important that we understand this, that one of the main ways that the enemy wants to work, one of the integral roles that he plays is by trying to sow seeds of accusation and doubt and suspicion about other people that lead to bitterness and unforgiveness and lead to anger that leads to sin and division. It's part of how he works. I want you to, to take a look at this passage. I think this is amazing. And, um, or maybe, yeah, maybe it shows up in thoughts like this. It's stuff like, man, these people are all hypocrites. You know, you should just leave this group or leave this church. That's one thought, accusatory thoughts about other people. Now, by the way, there's always a little kernel of truth in some of these things, isn't there? Like for sure, no one is, none of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. And are we hypocritical people? Yeah, we are. I mean, just get to know us long enough and that's gonna be true. I don't know if we're truly hypocrites because we never claim to be perfect in, this, in the first place. I don't know how that works, but there's always a kernel of truth. Uh, how about this one? They don't care about you at all. Yeah, they say they care. They don't really care about you. These people, they're talking about you behind your back and they might act one way in front of you, but who knows what they're saying when you're not around. In your marriage, man, your husband, he thinks you're worthless. He's thinking about other women at work. These are accusatory thoughts, things like this. Your wife thinks you're weak. She's disappointed in the way you provide for her. She's jealous of your neighbor's lifestyle. Shows up in things like this, stuff like, you know what, I, I, know, what, you know, I know what their problem is. You know what their problem is? I know what it is. And you identify and and find yourself judging motives of another person. And I'm just saying it shows up in a lot of different ways. And the Bible's gonna tell us that the enemy wants to use these things to cause division, to cause gossip, to cause slander, to cause insecurity, to cause anger that leads to sin, to cause bitterness. It's gonna, all those things are gonna show up. I think it's interesting in 2 Timothy chapter two, the Bible says this, says the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone and able to teach, not resentful. Now, why is it that, that the follower of Jesus shouldn't be quarrelsome or resentful? Well, if you look at the bottom, look what he says here. He says, because we need to escape from the trap of the devil. It's the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. 
And so the Bible's gonna seem to indicate to us that when we are in a place of unforgiveness, when we're in a place of bitterness and we have a resentful spirit towards another person, that that is actually something that the enemy wants to use because here's what I found. The thing that the enemy wants to do is he wants to get us fighting each other. And if we can fight each other, he knows that that means that we can't fight him. And that means he's got us where he wants us. It's, I, I thought it was really interesting. About a, mo- about a month ago, I was sent a video from a friend of mine, and it's a really interesting video. And I saw it, and I immediately thought of our enemy. And it's of, I think it's in Africa, and it's these two gazelles that are fighting each other. And they're just like going at it, they're button heads. And in this video, the whole time, there's this lion that's just hanging out in the back. And he sees his opportunity. In fact, I'll just kind of show you. This is a quick clip of it. It's a little bit pixelated. But this lion's back here. These guys are fighting. And then he just comes in, he sees his opportunity and dinner is served and he's got it. And when I saw this video, you should go check it out, by the way, it's, it's a really long video. That, this lion is hanging out back there for a long time. He's just watching and these two, these two gazelles are just fighting each other and fighting each other until he finds the opportune time and he gets in. When I saw that, I thought that's exactly how our enemy works. That's how he works. He gets us fighting each other The Bible's clear that mishandled anger, that unforgiveness and resentment gives Satan a particular edge. Look at at what some of these passages say. Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. It's talking about conflict resolution. And don't give the devil a foothold. See the connection he makes? He says, yeah, that the enemy wants to accuse others and he wants to use that to fuel bitterness and resentment towards that person and that's going to give the devil a foothold. Or in uh, 2 Corinthians, it talks about forgiveness. He says we should forgive for Christ's sake. And then he says, because we don't want Satan not with us. For we're not unaware of his schemes. This is a big part of how he works, as he wants to do that. So he's the accuser. He accuses God, he accuses us, he accuses others. And lastly, he's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. But I was gonna say he's the father of lies. That's, that's what he's been doing from the very beginning. And this is what Jesus says about him in John 8. It says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native tongue because he is a liar and he's the father of lies. And so the Bible is gonna tell us that from the very, very, very beginning, that this is his number one tactic is that he lies. He contorts and he twists God's word. He, he so clouds human thinking that he makes us think that what God says is good is bad, and what God says is bad is good. It confuses in those ways. He's a deceiver is what he is. He's a liar, and he's been this way from the very beginning. And let me tell you, it is his greatest weapon. It is his greatest weapon. He can so deceive people that it can lead to destruction. It can lead to lies that can lead to destructions of families, can lead to destruction of relationship, can lead to the destruction of health, can lead to the destruction of even human life because of deception and because of lies. And the Bible's gonna tell us that this is one of his greatest tactics. And so he is, the Bible's gonna tell us, he is an opposer, he is an accuser, and he is the deceiver. And so the scripture's gonna say we should not be ignorant of his schemes. But let me tell you that while it's true we shouldn't be ignorant of his schemes, we also shouldn't be ignorant of his defeat. Because the Bible tells us that while he is a real enemy, he is a defeated enemy enemy. And we talked about this last week in the book of Colossians. It's going to say that when Jesus Christ came because of his life, because of his death, and because of his resurrection, he disarmed the powers and authorities, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so here's what the Bible's going to say. When a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, and I want you to hear me. If you're a person investigating Jesus, we're so, we're so glad you're here. I know this might seem like such a weird topic to you, but let me just say that when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, and only, and only when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible is going to tell us that they are victorious, that we are victorious over this enemy. Listen, without Jesus, apart from Jesus, we are hopeless. But because of Jesus, we are victorious. And that's why the Bible is going to tell us that those who follow Jesus, we are not fighting for victory. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting, we're fighting from it. Jesus has already given us victory over the enemy. So he, for those of us who follow Jesus, he only has two weapons. He's been disarmed. So he only has two strategies that against us right now. And what are they? That he's a liar and he's an accuser. And that's all he can do. 
Because outside of that, he has been disarmed. He has been rendered powerless. And so all he has is lies and all he has is accusations. And this is why Ephesians chapter six is going to tell us over and over again, for those of us who follow Jesus, that we just need to take our stand. In fact, did you know four times in this short passage, he is going to say to the Christian, stand. So what do you need to do? You just need to stand. You need to stand. Look, look, look at this. He says in verse 11, take your stand against the devil's schemes that you might be able to stand. And after everything, you should stand. And so stand firm. And so four times he's gonna say, listen, it is an already defeated battle. And so as a follower of Jesus, you just need to stand in the victory that is already accomplished in Jesus Christ. He doesn't say fight the devil. He doesn't say fight for freedom. He says, no, listen, you just need to fix your feet, plant your feet in what Jesus Christ has done for you. That's what you need to do. It's already been won for you. In the time of accusation, plant your feet in what Jesus has already accomplished for you is what he's going to tell us. See, because here's what the enemy wants you to do. The enemy doesn't want you to stand. He wants you to sit. He wants you to run. He wants you, he wants you to, to fall. He wants you to move off of the place of trusting God and believing his truth. That's what he wants you to do. And he's gonna use lies and he's gonna use accusations to do it. And so Paul's gonna say, you just have to stand. You have to stand. You know, I want you to think about this for a minute. If the enemy has accusations and deception, if he's an accuser and he's a deceiver, then what is the best way to combat these things? Well, I think it's these two things. It's that we trust God and that we believe his truth, that we stand here. We stand in a place of, yeah, we, we know there's an enemy. We know there's one who's opposing God. We know he's an accuser. And so when we hear the accusing voice coming in, this is who God is, God, God can't be trusted, what do we do? We stand here. No, 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 no. I know there's an accuser, I know this is coming, but listen, I know what God says about himself. And I believe that what he says is true. And I'm choosing to trust him. And so I'm gonna stand on that. That's what he's saying, right? Yeah, there's an accuser. He's gonna accuse you. He's going to. And don't be surprised when he does, because he will. So what do you do when he accuses you? Here's what you do. You just stand there. You stand and trust in truth. You say, yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I, I know that voice. I know the accuser. But let me just remind myself, that's not what Jesus says about me. And so I'm gonna stand firmly on what he said is true. I'm not moving from that place. That's what he's talking about. Yeah, he's gonna accuse you about other people. He's gonna say things about others. And you can, you can, you can just, listen, you can just expect it. It's gonna happen. So what do you do? You stand and say, no, I'm gonna trust what God said about them. I'll trust him. I'm gonna believe what he said is true. Now let me just tell you, trust and truth, these two things, are actually what the entire armor is is all about. And so next week, we're gonna start talking about the armor of God, and we're gonna talk about it for the next three weeks. And it's all about, practically speaking, how do you stand in this spot of trust and the truth? And so next week, we're gonna dig into the armor that God is going to command us to put on. I'm gonna ask the band to make their way up here at this time. As the band settles in, I just wanna say two quick things, and then we'll, we'll sing, and we'll get a chance to worship God together. First one is this, if you're a person who is here and you're maybe exploring Christianity, maybe you're investigating Christ, like I said earlier, we, just, we count it such a privilege that you would be here. And I know this might sound like such a weird topic to you, but can I just tell you something that I believe with all my heart is true and it's what the scripture teaches us and it's, it's this, is that God loves you. And you know, maybe you're here and someone invited you or you got connected online and or maybe you're just kind of trying to figure out the whole God thing, and for some reason you're here. Well, I believe that maybe you're here to hear this. God loves you, and he deeply desires a relationship with you, and he deeply desires that you would live a life for him. He wants that. He actually wants to, to, to empower you and use you in the lives of other people. I believe that. But let me tell you, and you just need to know this, there is an opposer. There is one who opposes everything that God wants to do in your life. And maybe you feel that. There is someone who, wants, who does not want you to be in a right relationship with God and is going to do everything possible to try to keep you from engaging and from having a relationship with him. 
Maybe you feel that. You also need to know this. He is also an accuser. And so he's going to accuse you and he's going to accuse God. He's going to make you, he's going to say stuff like this. He's going to tell you that if you start following God, then that means that it's going to be the end of fun. It's going to be the end of freedom. That following God is going to restrict you. It's going to keep you from the things that you, and let me just tell you, I just want to tell you that it's a lie. It's a lie. He's lying to you. It's what he does. And he's done it from the very beginning. And I just want you to know, if you run from God, you run from life. And if you run to God, you run to life. Let me just say, there's an accuser. He's going to accuse you. Some of you even hear his voice right now. And he's gonna tell you, don't give your life to God. Don't give your life to to Jesus. This is all dumb. He's gonna say things like this. God could never forgive you. If these people, if these people knew what you've done, where you've been, if they knew even what you did last weekend, they would understand you're not deserving of the forgiveness of God. And let me just tell you, look, look at me. He is lying to you. He is a liar and he is an accuser. And there is an opposer who's trying to keep you from a relationship with God. And I just wanna tell you the truth. And the truth is that he loves you and he has done everything to come and offer you forgiveness of sins in a relationship with him. You can turn to him today. You can turn to him now and you can pray to him and you can just say, Jesus, I wanna trust you and I wanna believe what you said is true. And you can do that. And I would encourage you to, even in these next moments. And lastly, let me just say, for those of us who do follow Christ, you know, maybe for some of you, you're coming in here today and quite honestly, maybe you're just feeling a little weary from the battle because it's real. There, there are accusations, and maybe for some of you, you're coming in and you're experiencing some faith-shaking circumstances in your life. You're tired of the accusations, you're tired of the lies, and you, you see it all. It's in our world, and you see it maybe even in your own life. So can I just say that maybe for a moment, one of the best things we can do, I think, is sing the truth of God. Just let it wash over you. Let it wash over you. And what we're gonna do is I'm actually gonna have the band play, and as they do, I wanna put some verses on the screen, some true things about God and some true things about how we can trust him. And I wanna encourage you as the band plays, man, just, would you just allow some of the, if you're a follower of Jesus, would you just allow some of these verses, don't just read them, ingest them. Let them wash over you. Let them drown out the lies and the accusations and the voice of the opposer and stand on the truth that you see within them. Jesus, I just wanna say thank you that you have not kept us in the dark on these things, but you have told us that there is an enemy. We are not ignorant of his schemes. So God, I pray that you would help us, help all of us, Lord, to trust you and to believe what you said is true and help us to do that more and more so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. I pray it all in Jesus' name.